In 1918, Helen Lemmel, who was a daughter of an English Methodist minister, published her hymn entitled The Heavenly Vision. Many of us here actually do know that hymn, but we know it by the chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Now, of course, 1918 England was and had been for the last couple of years severely shaken by World War I. And then add to that that returning troops carried with them the influenza leading to the pandemic of 1918. That's helpful to see the context that the things of earth must have loomed very large for many Christians living in 1918. Easily becoming the main thing in their vision. Life for them was tough. And the future, no doubt, seemed very uncertain. They needed to turn their eyes upon Jesus. You see, without it, the things of the world, the things of this earth, they do dominate our thinking. And when we fall into that trap, and when our eyes are on us, that tends to colour our thinking, it clouds our judgement, and it sours our hearts. In Revelation chapter 1, John was in isolation by the government on Patmos. He was experiencing genuine persecution for his faith in Christ. He'd lost his job. He's cut off from his loved ones. He knew that the churches were feeling the pressure of the pagan government. Many of those churches closest to him, they were really struggling. Some were under threat of closure. The last remaining apostle John and the local churches needed to have their eyes, you see, turned toward Jesus. They needed to look into his wonderful face for it was only then that the things of earth in their day would grow dim in light of the glorified Son of Man. And so the vision that we have here in Revelation chapter 1 of the glorified Son of Man is a vision that we each need. And hence, God has preserved it for us in our Bibles. And so we're taking a few Lord's Days at the front end of this new year to turn our eyes onto the glorified Son of Man. Last week we considered uh, the garment of the glorified Son of Man from Revelation 1 verse 13. Today we're going to move forward and we'll focus on verse 14 and perhaps the first part of verse 15. But just let me make this comment quickly as we come to the subject again. You see, as we return to this scene, we must realize, I just maybe need to state the obvious, but this is a symbolic picture of the glorified Christ. None of this description is to be understood literally, is it? As if the seven churches are literal candlesticks? How ridiculous that would be. Or as if Christ's tongue was a tangible, real sword. No, you see, this is all picture language. And yet the symbolic picture is rich in meaning. And so it vividly teaches us who Christ is today in glory. As we saw last week, He is the glorified Christ who walks amongst His churches. And this morning as we move forward in our study, we're going to take up the next three aspects of the glorified Son of Man in these next couple of verses. And the first thing I draw your attention to that John sees in verse 14 is what I'm calling his head in its purity 
and dignity. His head in its purity and dignity. Let's go back to the passage, Revelation chapter 1, and just reread the scene from verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. What John sees now on Patmos in this vision, Daniel had seen before. Let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Daniel. And I made reference last week to the fact that if we're going to understand so much in the book of Revelation, we need to understand the Old Testament. In Daniel chapter 7, made reference in passing, I believe, to this last week. But in Daniel chapter 7, let's just read a couple of verses from verse 13. Here is Daniel's vision. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Here is the prophetic vision of how, in verse 13, I believe, how Christ will come back into heaven after he has died and after he has triumphantly been risen from the dead. And so Daniel's looking forward. He's got a prophetic vision of what's going to happen with the Son of Man. He returns into heaven, as verse 13 says, in the clouds. He returns to who? He returns to the Ancient of Days. He goes back to heaven. He goes back to God in heaven. And in verse 14, he's given a kingdom. He is a king. He is ruling. When he goes back, he becomes the ruler. Now John sees this same one in Revelation chapter 1. This one like the Son of Man, the glorified Son of God. He sees him after he's gone back to heaven. He's returned to the Ancient of Days. He's seen him there in his role as the, the ruling king. Now, if we still in Daniel 7, back up a few verses and we see how the Son of Man is described. It's actually, this is where we see a similar description to what John sees. So it's still in Daniel 7, verse verse 9. He said, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame and his wheels a burning fire. So here he, he, he's actually called here in verse 9, the Ancient of Days. He's wearing a garment. We already saw that last week from Revelation chapter 1. But did you, look, did you see the description of his head? He's got white hair, which is similar to Revelation chapter 1 verse 14. So maybe this is a reference to purity, Often you know this, I'm sure. Often in in the Bible, white is the color that's used to symbolize cleanness, right? And even today, still companies advertise their washing powder and they boast that it's their product that gets pure white. And you've seen the images on the TV commercials and and there's the the so-called guy in his white lab coat or it's supposedly mum in the laundry and she holds up her white nappy or she holds up, I guess you don't do that anymore, you have throwaways, don't you? You you hold up your white shirt and, and the boast is this product makes it pure white, really clean. When God washes out away our sin, what does he do? Isaiah 1.18, it says, They shall be white as snow. 
And so there is John on Patmos. We come back to Revelation chapter 1, this same one that he sees that Daniel saw. And though John is a forgiven man, though John is washed in the blood of Christ, John is still on the earth. He's, he's, he's living in a wicked world. He's, he's staying by sin still himself. And no wonder in Revelation 1 verse 17, no wonder... <laughs> John falls at Jesus' feet like a dead man because who can stand in the presence of the pure, sinless Son of Man? Not even angels, not even pure, sinless angels will look on the face of God. Isaiah 6 shows us that. With two wings they cover their face. John saw the head of the Son of Man as white. Perhaps as well, this could be a reference to the head, the part of our body that we think. So all the thinking, all the counsel of Christ is pure. Yes, the world, and even we at times may think we have better ideas. Even some of the churches in Asia were beginning to be tempted to think that way. But Jesus' ways, Jesus' thoughts, Jesus' ideas, they, are, they, they can never be improved. They are never tarnished with insufficiency or, or any measure of error. His mind is always pure. He has a white head. John saw that. And as we think further on this, it's likely that by the time that Revelation chapter 1 happens in the life of John, that John himself is grey-headed. It would seem very likely that by the time this is happening to John, he's in his early 90s, and he's probably got a white crop of hair himself. And John turns around and he sees the vision of Christ. First he sees the garment, then he notices his head, and then he highlights his white hair. It's like wool, it's white as snow. In the Bible, the hoary head, the grayish white hair, is a way sometimes simply to speak of older people. Or, I say this respectfully, the ancient ones. As one who's going grey myself, or gone, whichever one it is. The older ones, the ancient ones, the, the wiser ones who have been around longer than you with one exception here. Yeah. They are the ones who are valuable to us for wisdom, for counsel. I wonder, how often have you in your life, how often do you go to older ones for counsel? They are the ones who have built up wisdom over the years. I, I fear many younger ones make significant decisions by consulting their own thinking. That's it. Or maybe their peers. Now the Bible does warn that there can be old fools. Okay, so it's not just get old and therefore automatically makes you wise. What, what I'm raising is mature saints, ones who have walked with Christ for decades, ones who have been in their Bibles daily for decades, ones who understand the world, the devil, and their own hearts, ones who have proven churchmanship or churchwomanship by the long stride of years. Th those ones are often the ones that possess balanced thinking. Balance is not the tendency of youth. And here is John. What's he do? Verse 17, he bows. He bows before the Ancient of Days, the one who is full of wisdom. Leviticus 19.32 says, You shall rise to give honor before the gray-headed and honor the presence of the old man. Here is John. He's responding in honor. He's got a physical posture response that relates to honour. He's yielding in submission before the ancient of days, the white-headed Christ. In our culture, this is almost gone. And it's almost gone in the church. 
Now, of course, the Son of Man is not like us. Let, let me just clarify. The Ancient of Days does not decay, like we do when we get old. The Ancient of Days doesn't grow old. The Ancient of Days doesn't, like, everything slowing down as you get older. The Ancient of Days is not like that. His strength does not diminish just because the years roll by. His hoary head speaks of the antiquity of his reign. Before there was even time as we know it, the Son of God was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what did this very one say in Revelation 1 verse 8? Go back up in the passage, verse 8. He'd already spoken back in verse 8. He says, I am the Alpha the first letter of the Greek alphabet, you're getting acquainted, some of you are learning the Greek alphabet via the coronavirus. Right? Alpha's the first letter, Omega's the last letter. So he's saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, I'm the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Again in verse 11, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. The Ancient of Days has white hair. It points to his dignity. Honor is due him. Respect and submission. Again, we could add Proverbs 16 and verse 31 says, The silver haired head, it is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. And surely the Lord Jesus himself is the way of righteousness. He is no fool. He is all wisdom. He is righteousness. And so can you see what an important perspective for John as we understand the context of the vision? You see the, 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 that John was to embrace this one in the middle of his season of tribulation. And so John was not to complain to this Jesus about, oh, how harshly he was being treated in the circumstance of his life, and woe, woe, woe is me. We don't see John whinging and complaining about how hard done by he was by the government. We see him prostrating, paying homage to the Ancient of Days, to the very one who in his wisdom had ordained this difficult period of persecution to fall upon the church at the end of the first century under the pagan emperor Domitian who was reigning at this time. And in the end, Jesus was king and, and Jesus had planned what was unfolding in the life at this time, tough as it was for the old man John. His head and hair were white like wool, white as snow. Turn, brethren, turn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. John looks again. In verse 14 it says in the second half, and his eyes, his eyes were like a flame of fire. And so here's the second point this morning, his eyes with penetrating visibility. His eyes with penetrating visibility. The other week, in our, our recent drive down through New South Wales, we, we saw the evidence still of the fires from two years ago. And, and it was a contrast, really. On, on one hand, the devastation from the fire could still be seen. And yet on the other, other hand, we saw fresh growth. And it's true, isn't it? When you think of fire. 
Fire can be helpful. Fire in winter can bring, bring warmth. It can bring comfort. It's helpful. And then fire in the heat of the summer with high winds can be terrifying. Are you with me? So on, one, on the one hand, fire is a helpful thing. And yet on the other hand, fire is a terrifying thing. And so I want to suggest that those two aspects can relate to what John saw. His eyes were like flames of fire or a flame of fire. And you see, for some, that can be a helpful, comforting thing. And for others, this can be a terrifying, it can be a dreadful thing. These eyes, like a flame of fire, describe the penetrating gaze of Christ. Those searching eyes, they see all things. No one can hide from the eyes of Christ. Not one thing misses His view. He has penetrating visibility. Hebrews 4 and verse 13 teaches us this. It says, There is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked, and they are open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. This is such a frightening thing. Eyes like a flame of fire. Fire that will consume. Fire that will bring to utter ruin. This is the type of fire from which there is no escape. Tragically, it's like what happened two years ago. Like many people who, who tried to flee, they tried to run away from the raging fire, but they couldn't get away. The fire trapped them or the fire quickly turned and it consumed them. I tried to find how many people died in that way. I, I think it was something like 34 people two years ago were, and couldn't escape. There is no escape from the eyes of Christ. You can't run from them. They're penetrating. They are inescapable. And you see, friends, all the enemies of the gospel who had unleashed a terrible wave of persecution on the Christians toward the end of the first century, those who had sent John to Patmos, those who, who refused to forsake their idolatry and their immorality, they were called to do that through the gospel, but they refused to do that, those associated in, in the Roman culture. All those people, all of them, were all seen by the Son of Man. None of them escaped His gaze. His eyes were like a flame of fire in that first century. Unless they had repented, they would have been consumed in the wrath of God. And that is where they still are this morning. I also want to highlight these eyes like a flame of fire. They can be understood to be helpful. <laughs> there is comfort here as well. You see... Proverbs 15 verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Yes, He watches the evil, but His eyes are everywhere, looking at everyone, and He sees those who are good, that is, those who are right before Him, His people. And here is this, this very Jesus who's presented himself before John on this Lord's Day. He's described by Peter as the overseer of our souls, the overseer of the souls of his people, the, the great shepherd of his sheep. He's the great ultimate bishop who oversees his believers. There's not one soul, not one sheep. There's not one incident. There's not one tear. There's not one struggle or heartache that Christ does not see. You see, those penetrating eyes of the loving flame of fire, they actually even get below the surface. They see deep into the heart. Jesus sees every broken heart. He sees every wounded heart. He sees every fearful heart. He sees every struggling heart of His people. And so that means He knows all about our difficulties. 
What a comfort that must have been for John at a time like this that he was in the middle of. Perhaps John, and maybe you can relate to this, perhaps John was not able to put into words the struggles that were going on deep down inside. Christ saw it. Christ understood it. You see, whatever is the hour the church is passing through in any given nation, whatever trial His people have to endure, the Lord Jesus knows all about it. His penetrating gaze oversees every soul. What a comfort. What's your struggle today, Christian? Perhaps it's something that you can't even answer me in words. Jesus sees it. The eyes like a flame of fire are a tremendous comfort for all Christ's people. He oversees our souls. But if you are not a then the eyes like a flame of fire, they are a terrifying thing for you. And, and if they're not, it's because you didn't listen. You're ignoring what is true. And, and, and because this is a terrifying thing for those not saved, you need to understand that there is hope. That there is actual hope for you that you can turn from your sin, sin which Christ knows all about in your life, and you can cry out to Him for forgiveness. Now you know what this means, boys and girls? That Jesus saw you when you were naughty and you thought, no one else saw me. Jesus saw you. And He knows about that lie that you told. So children, you need to understand that Jesus can forgive you. You ask Him to save you, and He will. And so can you see the, the penetrating visibility of Christ's eyes? It can be a great dread, but then it can turn and it actually can become a great comfort if we own our sin, if we confess our sin, if we forsake our sin, and if we ask God to forgive us our sin through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, John sees something else. And this is the third point. His feet of stability and victory. His feet of stability and victory. See what he, how he describes the feet in verse 15. He says, His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. Now who is John looking at? He's looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's looking at the one who never changes. He's looking at the one who is steadfast. He's looking at the one who is consistent with his own purpose. He is looking at the one who's like brass. He's stable. And here's John on loan. He's living at such a turbulent time in the history of the church. All the other apostles, his former colleagues in the ministry, his close friends who he walked around um, the Holy Land with, with Jesus, or all of them have died. They're, they're in heaven, but he's not. Many of the first generations of those who were the first generation of converts who did come to faith under the preaching of the apostles, many of them have already died. Or they are in the process of dying off or being put to death by the Romans. And so you can imagine, can't you, that it's an obvious question to ask when they're getting to this point, will the church last? Many preachers that Christ 
had initially raised up in that first generation of believers in the church had now been silenced. And I wonder whether John was asking the question that often men who are preachers ask, especially as they're over the hump and getting toward the latter part of ministry. They ask the question, where are all the preachers now? You see, many of those men were old. Some of them probably were in prison. They're on the road to death. And so to the human eye, it could have looked pretty bleak. This was real persecution, brethren. Over the last two years, some have claimed that the COVID government rules have been designed to persecute the church. I personally am not convinced of that argument. The, the COVID government rules have been for the whole community. The church hasn't been targeted. You want to see Christian persecution? I invite you to come with me and meet Pastor Danielle in his country and see what it is like to be a Christian there. I invite you to come with me and meet another pastor in Hong Kong who goes regularly into China and see what it's like for Christians there. Have any of you ever read this book? Well, maybe it doesn't look like this, but it's called The Fox's Book of Martyrs. You know, beside the Bible, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, I believe, was the most read book by Christians in 17th century Puritan England. Children were read this. People were raised having their minds saturated with Scripture being clearly instructed and understanding through the Fox Book of Martyrs and, and often also with that was the reading of and the knowledge of Pilgrim's Progress. An excellent treatise of what it is to live the Christian life. I think the state of the Christian church today would be in a far better place if we unplug the internet, got off YouTube and read this book, at least start there, to see what real persecution is. To see in church history what it has meant to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. It's such a world away from our easy lives, surrounded by our comforts and distracted with our toys. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3 gives us direction. We are told to remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. God willing, in two weeks we will start our special prayer service where we're going to focus on the persecuted church. I encourage you to be present for that evening meeting on the fifth Sundays in the month. Back to John. Here's John. He's the last apostle. Think of the others. Paul has been beheaded. Peter has been crucified upside down. Both of those men under Nero. Mark was burned during Trajan's reign. Thomas killed in India, Matthew speared to death, Andrew crucified, just to name a few. John, he's got about him many enemies of the gospel. Life is so uncertain and yet John saw one in the midst of the churches and he sees his feet and what does he see? He sees one who is strong, who is sturdy, who is unchangeable in his purposes. Christ was not shaken in the first century. He's never been shaken and he's not shaken today. What an encouragement this must have been to aging John who was ostracized from his brethren that he might see this one in whom he could have full and utter confidence. His feet were like fine brass 
as if refined in a furnace. There's another thought here. Robert Murray McShane raises it and it's worth sharing. He says, they used to put brass hoofs on the cattle and then send them into the threshing floor to thrash the corn. See them going around and around. Brass hoofs underneath those hooves, smashing down those individual grains. And he says, Christ seems to allude to that here. Here is Christ, if that's the case, presented as the one who's going to tread down, he's going to trample all of his enemies. Now already, by the time this vision happens, already he has trampled down one enemy, hasn't he? He's defeated death. Isn't that his claim in verse 18? I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now, as far as John probably could see from where he was sitting there on the island of Patmos, he was soon to face death himself. What an encouragement then to see these feet. Whatever enemies of the gospel were active in John's day or in ours, here is the glorified Son of Man. And perhaps for a season, the Son of Man allowed them to terrorize Christians. But those enemies are nothing to Christ. That they'll become like a little grain of corn as it meets the brass hoof of one of those beasts on that first century threshing floor. Perhaps sometimes those little grain of corn got arrogant and thought, aha, got away with it until the beast came around the next time and they didn't escape the crush. Eventually their time would come and all would be trampled down. Now there's no question the Roman persecutors were cruel. Let me give you an example from, from this book by Fox. He says, and he's speaking about this time, he says death was not considered enough punishment for the Christians. They were whipped, disemboweled, torn apart, and stoned. Plates of iron were laid on them, and they were strangled, eaten by wild animals, hung and tossed on the horn of bulls. And no doubt those Roman persecutors thought that they had escaped the treatment such of those saints in their arrogance. But the Christ who stood before John would ensure that every enemy of the gospel would be trampled under his brass feet. And you know, after listing the, this, that, that ho that such horrible treatment that went on in John's day, Fox goes on to say in this book, which by the way, there's a copy of this in the church library. He goes on to say, Nevertheless, the church continued to grow deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and watered by the blood of the saints. And John saw the feet that accomplished that. He saw their stability and he saw their victory. And so Christian friends, as we bring our study to a conclusion this morning, whatever persecution may come our way, and I do, for the record, believe that's where we're going. There's evidence of that, I think, beginning to show. But, but whatever it is, by way of what's coming our way, whatever the future holds, we will not fear. But rather we can have confidence in our glorified Christ. And so whatever comes in the year 2022, His strength can be perfected in our weakness. Whatever comes in this year, all those that the Father gave to the Son, all of those will come to Him to be saved before Jesus comes back again. All of them. Guaranteed. Christ will accomplish His purpose. And so we need not fear, men. We need not fear what is coming down the road. The things of the world, well, they may look large in our eyes. And they will look large in our eyes if that's the thing 
that's in our vision. But see his head in its purity and its dignity. See his eyes in their penetrating visibility and see his feet of stability and victory. Brethren, turn your eyes upon this Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things on earth that are going on at the moment, they will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Would you pray with me as we come to our Lord and ask for him to take this word and to seal it to our hearts. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we pray that Whatever I have said that is not being true to the word of God, blow it away for the chaff that it is. But where it is the wheat, where it is the true kernel of the truth, where it is actually what you want and what you tell us and who you are, we pray that you would so embed it in our beings that it would become part of us, part of our consciousness, part of our, our very thinking, that we would have the very mind of Christ in us, that we would know what the will of the Lord is, that we would act wisely, that we would not be fools, but that, Lord, that we would walk in that good path as you have ordained it for us. We believe that is the path of safety ultimately, Lord, but, but in the end it, it's not even about us that, we believe it's the path that will glorify you. And so please help us to be on that path and to stay on that path. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.